record on this one. Okay, our recording is in progress, as you probably just heard. Um, welcome to our latest in our wonderful series of webinars of topics of interest to our friends, family, those who are part of the universe of Friendship Place. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm uh, Chris Redledge, Chief Development Officer. Uh, and I don't want to take much time speaking. I actually want to toss first to uh, Jean-Michel, and then we can really get things started. As I mentioned to some folks when we, uh, who came on a little early, it, uh, I can certainly come up with some great questions. I'm sure that, you know, you'll, but, but this is so much more worthy if you come up with questions. So please drop questions in the chat. And Peter, Alyssa will be happy. And I see Ariel Levinson, uh, Waldman will be on also for speaking a little bit to supplement what Peter is saying. But please come up with great questions uh, because that's what makes this really exciting and interactive. Jean-Michel, I'm going to toss to you right now and actually mute myself. And uh, so you don't hear any background noise here. Jean-Michel, over to you. Yes, well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being online uh, with us for today's uh, presentation. Uh, this is a, an exciting way to start our fall lineup, and I hope you will uh, follow us this fall and uh, attend other events that we are organizing. I um, want to thank the development team for organizing the event, and of course, I want to thank you, Peter, very, very much for making the time to be with us today. We appreciate your support. Thank you, Lisa, for um, being part of this conversation as well. And thank you, Council Member Shea, Mary, for being with us again. We appreciate you very much. Mary has been a great friend of Friendship Place through the years. We, uh, we go way back uh, with Mary at Friendship Place. We appreciate your support so much. Mary, would you like to say a few words? Well, that's nice handing it off to me. Uh, I, I just wanted to lurk uh, and listen to Peter because I haven't seen him or talked to him in a while. Um, no, uh, let me let me pass back to you, kudos, because um, just Monday, I gave a presentation to the people at the Colonnade, and it was about 75 people. And one of the questions was, you know, I'm worried about uh, the homelessness that I see on the streets, et cetera. What can I do as one person? I said, well, there are many things you can do. I said, but the thing you should do first is you should contact Friendship Place because they have the best programs to help people who are experiencing homelessness and they'll put you to work. So um, that's my usual go-to when people ask me individually, you know, what they can do. Thank you so much, Mary. Very good, thank you. Yeah, Jean-Michel, anything else you wanna say before we toss to Peter? Let's just get going. Okay, Peter, uh, it is over to you, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm so delighted that you asked me to come. Um, and uh, of course, uh, one of the reasons why you have so many people today is not me. Uh, it's the, the support and, and the work of, of uh, Frank Friendship uh, Place uh, and the wonderful work uh, that's done. Uh, and so, uh, I, I, that's a special reason for me to be able to be here. And uh, of course, uh, to, to see Mary, that's, uh, that's terrific. And um, the, uh, so uh, th thank you, Chris, and, and uh, thanking to uh, Jean-Michel. Uh, I'm gonna talk about, uh, as I, I think you know, and what was said to draw you, uh, to talk about uh, criminalization of poverty uh, and a little bit more. Uh, so, so uh, what is that? Uh, you know, we we have uh, talked uh, uh, about mass incarceration uh, for uh, a, a long time and horrible and and uh, the uh, uh, the results of of uh, in our country and and on uh, individual people. Um, and uh, the, the terminology of criminalization of poverty is perhaps uh, not quite, even though the individual things, uh, Mary talked about hom homelessness and uh, certainly one aspect uh, of being homeless uh, is, is uh, it's uh, t taking poverty and, and making it uh, into criminalization. Uh, the people who are uh, 
taking off, uh, being on the street, being in a park, whatever it is. And so many places in the country, uh, the result of that is, is thrown in, in, into jail. So that's one example. Um, and so uh, it's kind of a nasty, if you will, uh, sibling of mass incarceration. It, it, it's uh, the, the, the brother sister. Uh, in talking to you, criminalization of poverty, uh, it uh, have in mind uh, for not all of these things. Uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about mostly, and at the beginning. Uh, one of the reasons for it uh, is, is uh, revenue, uh, which is certainly not for homeless people, but uh, other aspects, which I'll talk, uh, talk about. And uh, secondly, uh, racism, uh, because so many of the things that we're talking about are disproportionately uh, made and, and hit on the people of color. Uh, and then uh, too much of this, and I'm talking nationally. So some of the things that I'm saying uh, are not things that uh, I mean, we can homelessness we have, of course, but so many other things are, are national and not so much uh, uh, locally. Uh, but uh, when we do get uh, to uh, Ariel, Levinson, and Waldman, uh, is going to talk on some, some things uh, locally. Uh, and uh, also some things uh, that are not uh, criminalization, but I want to talk uh, uh, later uh, about some aspects of, of uh, things that uh, we're th thinking about. Mary certainly working very hard uh, in, on housing and, and losing their housing uh, in our city as it is in many parts in, in the country. But um, let me let me get to my main uh, part of topic uh, here. Um, you know, I know a lot about about poverty. Uh, I, I've been uh, working on these issues uh, uh, since since I worked for Robert Kennedy uh, in um, in the 1960s before we lost him. Um, but. Uh, New, uh, more closer uh, in in what I want to talk about here, uh, not the '60s, but but really in the '80s, uh, and we didn't even know that. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Uh, we had uh, we became knowledgeable about uh, a national problem on fines and fees, uh, and relating to that money bail. Um, and again, this is this is largely uh, national and, and in state after state after the all over the country. Uh, and uh, we we also uh, have, at least for me, and I think for a lot of us, uh, understanding that there there are other things that I want to at least mention a little bit uh, min uh, minutes later uh, that. There's more to criminalization of poverty uh, than the fines and fees or the money bail. But let me start uh, with the fines and fees and, and uh, money bail. Uh, what often, and, and a number of you will, will this, know this, uh, why uh, my, opens, my eyes uh, happened in uh, Ferguson, uh, uh, Missouri. Uh, as many of others know, uh, in 2014, uh, beyond the uh, killing of Michael Brown there, uh, it was abusing uh, when, when uh, it became public and, and the Department of Justice then came out to say, what, what, what's going on here, uh, thinking that they were gonna look at why Michael Brown was, was murdered. And uh, that was certainly uh, horrible and needed to work on that. But uh, DLJ discovered that the people there in, in um, Ferguson, uh, beyond the killing of uh, Michael Brown, was abusing its, its uh, own uh, citizens with unbelievably uh, exorbitant fines and fees uh, for fine, minor crimes uh, and sending them to jail when they could not pay. Uh, 
and uh, it's a little wacky uh, because if somebody who doesn't have any money and you throw them in, in may, uh, jail because they didn't pay and they couldn't pay and they have to pay the for the for the uh, the, the the bed and and uh, what you eat. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it was done, and not just in Ferguson. We found out as a result of this. Um, because uh, DOJ uh, wrote uh, that was national uh, about the searing report uh, and uh, what it found. Uh, and this, this of course, uh, is when Obama was the president. I think we understand that. Uh, was this huge mass of uh, fines and fees, and I'll talk about it, and driver's license suspensions, uh, which is something that has been an issue uh, in, in the DC, and gross uh, abuse of, of money bail, uh, and paying, uh, as I said, for room and board in jail and, and prisons. Uh, so what's the root? Where did, where did this come? Where did this come from? Uh, it's not quite the same as mass incarceration. It's related uh, to it. It goes back to the, the anti-tax uh, rebellion that happened in the in the Reagan uh, era. It goes back to that. Uh, you remember that people it popped up so-called and sometimes real user fees. Uh, and uh, replacing uh, things that were done by governments uh, had, that were financed by taxes. And instead of uh, the so-called user re, uh, reads fees, uh, and uh, the, that would hit people, millions and millions of people. Uh, and I'll explain to you why once they're hooked, uh, they have to pay money uh, for uh, sometimes till they die. So uh, that's why I wrote, wrote a book about it. Um, so let's let's take uh, uh, well just one example, but but uh, it's it's typical. Uh, actually, there, there's more on the the uh, driver's license. I'll talk about that in a minute. But just this one example here is a man named named Ado Edwards uh, from Peller, Pelham, uh, uh, Georgia, uh, and uh, he Edwards had a significant uh, intellectual uh, disability, and he could not read and write. Um, and he was, found, uh, he's black, of course, uh, and uh, he was fined $500 for burning leaves without a permit. And he was hauled in and uh, he was told that he has to pay another $528 for a so-called uh, probation uh, that was run there, uh, as, as is the case in 13 states. A, a, probation, a probation agency uh, that's run by uh, a for-profit company. So Mr. Edwards could not come up with an instant payment of $250. The judge said that's what he had to pay and he was sent to jail. Uh, now here, uh, fortunately, uh, he's, he is low income. He is African-American, as I said, but unlike, uh, he was liberated. And why? Because he did have the fortune of, of getting a lawyer. Uh, Sarah uh, Garrett of the Southern Center for Human Rights uh, in, in uh, Georgia and Atlanta heard about the case and saved him because what they had done happened to be unconstitutional. And if Her Sarah had not found him, uh, we would never have heard of him. Uh, and he would be one of the thousands of people without a lawyer uh, who would be uh, uh, still stuck, still probably still stuck. So one point here uh, is how important for low income people on so many things, uh, not just these kinds of things of the fines and fees, um, but uh, in, in so many things where if you don't have a lawyer, uh, you're definitely, uh, bad things happen. So what is all this about? It's uh, pure and, and simple. 
uh, it's this criminalization that I've talked about in a system way, sy systemic way of states and communities to raise billions of dollars uh, because they weren't collecting taxes in the usual way starting in, in the 1980s. Um, so start for revenues and states and local governments turn to shaking people down. That's really what it is. Uh, and it's a 21st century debtors prison and then some. Uh, how does it work? Um, well, e Eagle uh, Edwards uh, has this conviction for a minor infraction, or although not minor for him because he couldn't come up with those monies. Uh, and uh, so many of these things shouldn't be laws at all. Uh, and what we really need to do, uh, I think probably locally, uh, anywhere in the, almost any place in the country, we should look at, at what laws that we have that shouldn't be laws. That's one aspect of it. In any case, uh, Aid Edwards is yet sentenced with an outsized fine and a fee that has nothing to do with the offense. Notice there are two different things here. The fine, which supposedly uh, you did something, and it's some yucky little thing that, that's been thrown up as a fine much bigger. Uh, and then the fee, which is completely made up, uh, that you have to pay uh, money for the, for the uh, library uh, in, the, in the local court, uh, just get some more money out. Uh, and of course the person can't pay. Uh, and so the court uh, sets up a, a payment plan. Um, and again, we're not talking for this uh, uh, DC, DC uh, largely. We have some things that, that we'll hear about uh, uh, later on uh, talking about REO. Uh, but they put you on so-called probation uh, and you have to pay for it and it's bogus. What do you mean you're paying money to be on probation? Whoever heard of that? Well, it happens that I talked about 13 states do it, do it for uh, for profit, but it actually 74 altogether, in, in other words, the other from, from another 31, they're public, public agencies, uh, kind of bizarre. And, and uh, it's, it's just all over the country. And as I said, not just for, for profit. And it's not just the, the paying for, uh, for to be on probation, but uh, you have to pay for a diversion. Of course, if you can't pay for a di diversion, you can't get diversion. Um, uh, electronic ankle prisons so that you can go home and not be in jail. If you can't pay for it, you can't do that. And that's, that's all, many, many places in, in, in the country. Fees all over the place. Um, and it's uh, again, just to, if we need any re reminding that disproportionately people of color. And it can run into thousands of dollars and go on forward uh, on uh, forever. The uh, interest bounce up, uh, criminal uh, contempt for not paying on the, on the tire of time, uh, new uh, debt on and on and different versions of it uh, in different states, but that's what it looks like. Uh, and the 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 largely the have these in uh, having to to uh, pay these uh, things that go beyond uh, what the judge said is often un unconstitutional. Um, and again, not enough lawyers. That's that's why even on something that's not constitutional, uh, there's no no uh, lawyer there. Another key uh, aspect uh, of, of it, uh, which is just so, it's bit much, much, much bigger, as big as this is, and that's money bail. Uh, because uh, that's uh, and it used in what I just said of fines and fees, but uh, anybody who gets uh, thrown in and, and they say you have to pay $100 uh, or, or more uh, in, in uh, paying bail, uh, and you can't pay it, uh, and of course you're 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 not guilt. You're just you're just uh, waiting on a minor misdemeanor, and they put it in jail. Uh, the person comes up with five hundred. Now, what happens to that? Well, you can go home. You play uh, guilty when you're not guilty. 
and that happens all over, uh, all over our country. And it's just, it, this is even more huge what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about. And, and of course, if you're stuck uh, in jail uh, and shouldn't be there, uh, uh, you can lose a job, you can lose your home, uh, your family can be uh, teared apart. Uh, and the numbers are there's 700,000 uh, 700, people uh, in jail every day uh, in the country. 700,000 on any given day, that many people. And 450,000 of those are not guilty of anything. They've just been put in there and they have not been put, uh, uh, they're not guilty. Uh, just they can't pay for bail. And of course, once they're in there, they get squeezed and they pay money for that and connected to that. Uh, and that's another way or adds to the getting the revenue uh, that I talked about. The biggest thing in this, uh, as I said briefly, uh, is about driver's license suspension. Uh, and um, this is the preferred way of getting this squeezing money because it's great. You know, you, you get, uh, you, you uh, had to use your car, you know, get to work, get to school, uh, go to the doctor, wh whatever it is. And so 70, 44 states uh, have been doing it. Now here, uh, I, this is, this is uh, good news. And, and, and we've been had that uh, uh, again, uh, Ariel will talk talk uh, about this, but uh, there are in the last uh, since people noticed after uh, 2014, uh, people have started to do things about it. And there's an organization that's called Fines and Fees Justice Center uh, that that's uh, working a whole campaign on driver's licenses, and they've got. Um, 22 uh, states have had uh, changes, some completely and others partly. 22 in, in the seven years uh, or for, uh, since, since uh, fines and fees and, and lawyers that work with them uh, or going to, going to le le legislatures. Um, and the Civil Rights Corps, which is fantastic, that works on these things and other related things. Um, so uh, we're seeing that there's a growing uh, force uh, of, of fighting back, uh, both with litigation and legislation advocacy. Uh, and and uh, we are going in the right direction, but we really have a, a long uh, way to go uh, on all of these things, license suspensions, fines and fees, all of that. Uh, and um, I'm looking at the clock. Clock. Uh, let me just say very fast uh, that the uh, what I've, I've said a number of times about the criminalization uh, on poverty. Uh, in, in fact, that that the the um, uh, the numbers of things that and I'm not even saying all of them, but you you get the idea that it's criminalization of poverty. One is a school to prison pipeline, where uh, particularly in the last uh, 20 to 25 years, uh, sending uh, people to court in state after state after the, instead of, of having uh, some scuffle on the, the playground and going to the uh, principal. Well, that's criminalization of poverty. Uh, uh, chronic nuisance uh, ordinances is, is absolutely Stunning, and this this is where uh, a, a woman there there's uh, uh, been hurt uh, terribly by uh, her husband, or a, a, usually, I mean, a, a man, and and uh, these uh, uh, ordinances uh, they say typically, and there's a lot of them around the country. Uh, I just heard about one a couple of weeks ago uh, in St. Louis Park in Minneapolis, uh, where, where I grew up. And uh, you only have four, four three cho choices uh, to go to the uh, police. Uh, and if you, if you use that up, 
uh, and you ask again for the police to help, they have given themselves the power to, to throw people out of the house. I mean, this is unbelievable. And I could talk to you more about that, but that's certainly criminalization of poverty. Um, Mary talked about homeless. Uh, again, criminalization of poverty, what happens to the homeless. Uh, con the, uh, collateral uh, consequences of when you when you come out of uh, having been in uh, a prison and there's literally 45,000 laws uh, that uh, ruin your life. Uh, and again, we're talking about uh, criminalization of poverty. We're talking about race and class. We're talking about uh, police often who shouldn't be doing what they're doing. Uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, I got lots more to say. But <laughs> I, uh, I think that you probably would like to hear from some other. Uh, so uh, please, uh, uh, let's, let's make it a conversation. Absolutely. Well, did you want to toss to Ariel to speak for a few minutes and then we can talk to listen and then open up for some questions? I, I think so, yes. Uh, I, I would, if I'd taken uh, more time, uh, which is so important all over the country uh, uh, and, and here uh, in, in terms of, of uh, people are, are evicted, uh, which is uh, an issue that's related because it's, uh, it's certainly in effect a, a criminal, they're not really criminal in the sense of throwing in jail. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in any case, Ariel is going to tell you uh, some things that he's been working on in the city that I think are important and people should know. Great. Ariel, if you could unmute, then we'll talk to Lisa after you. You're unmuted. Great. Thanks, Peter. And uh, thank you to Friendship Place, to Chris, to Jean-Michel. Uh, and fantastic to see Councilmember Che. Uh, and I want to mention some of the issues where, where she's been such a leader on um, in some of these fines and fees reforms uh, here in the district. Uh, that have gotten passed and also that are now in the pipeline, uh, thanks to her and colleagues uh, pushing and we're hopeful we'll, uh, we'll get passed uh, in the coming council session. Um, I wanna start uh, with something that's in Peter's fantastic book, which if you haven't read, I urge you to, uh, Not a Crime to be Poor, uh, published uh, at the very beginning of the Trump administration um, uh, and really uh, encapsulating so many of the themes uh, in terms of a, a national observation coming out of Ferguson that you heard about in the last couple of minutes from Peter. Something Peter said in that book has really driven a lot of our work at CEDEC DC, uh, uh, the nonprofit uh, organization uh, that I lead. We're headquartered uh, at UDC at the David A. Clark School of Law. Our mission is to serve DC residents uh, facing debt related problems. We do free legal work, public education, uh, and communications. And then most importantly for these discussions, I work at the systems level, the population level for change. Uh, and something that Peter wrote has really animated a lot of our efforts here. Uh, and Peter says, quote, the story of license suspensions reveals both the extent of the injury governments are willing to inflict on low income people in order to balance their books. All right, so uh, I don't wanna pause there before I get to the second thing. You heard a lot from Peter about revenue, revenue, revenue. Uh, you also heard about the other R inherent in so much of this racism uh, and racism uh, uh, underlying a lot of these um, backdoor tax policies, regressive tax policies, ways at extracting wealth from community members uh, uh, in a non-tax way. Um, uh, and so that's, uh, I think the, uh, the difficult and upsetting part of the story. Uh, the extent of the injury governments are willing to inflict on low-income people in order to balance their books. But number two, Peter also gives us a ray of hope. And he continues the sentence, and the results that advocacy can achieve to reduce the damage. And so here I wanna to turn to ways that we can reduce the damage through advocacy. I wanna talk briefly about the problem here in the district uh, and where, where, where things have been and where I think we can go. Um, in the District of Columbia, as you may know, we have massive wealth gaps that track race in incredibly pernicious ways. These arise from centuries and decades of structural racism and obstacles to opportunity, including policies 
that were in place during many of our lifetimes and some that are on the books today. What does that mean? The statistically typical white DC family has wealth as defined by net assets that is 8,100% more than the statistically typical African-American household next door or in a different part of the, of the district. An 8,000% differential. Similar numbers characterize the white Latina gap. Secondly, as Peter alluded to, the district, like so many places, has had policies that penalize the non-payment of fines or fees. And so, as the Washington Post has written about between 2010 and 2017, the District of Columbia suspended 126,000 residents' driver's licenses for unpaid fines and fees. No inquiry as to whether the person had the ability to pay. And these are mostly from the traffic context. Um, and it's quite easy uh, to get $100 or more uh, in fines or fees, uh, driving without a taillight, uh, or a uh, uh, quick doubling of the, the tickets, um, driving without um, uh, a few miles over the speed, speed limit, um, uh, oftentimes without the, without the right sticker. Um, and we combine this with a massively disparate concentration of police presence in our neighborhoods of color uh, and a really upsetting a picture starts to emerge. We have had an initial ray, uh, round of reform and uh, this has really been led uh, I'm so happy to say by council member Che and colleagues, uh, uh, Alyssa Silverman, Trey and White, a number of others in the DC council. So in 2018, the DC council stopped the law that allowed for the suspension of driver's licenses as punishment for unpaid debts. That was a really positive step. What the council did not do at the time, but what council member Che and others have proposed for this council period is addressing this continuing and similar problem of what we call a slow motion suspension. The denial of the renewal of the license as punishment for that same unpaid debt. And this matters so much because the back end results are literally the criminalization of poverty. The most common uh, cr a criminal charge in arrest for DC residents in any kind of uh, traffic pullover is driving without a license. 70% of cases are driving without a license. 70% of those arrests. And the racial uh, divides ought to disturb all of us. We are arresting here in the District of Columbia Black men at 19 times the rate of white men, black women at 18 times the rate of uh, white women. Uh, and this, uh, these two things, the wealth gaps and the uh, differentials in terms of arrest rates um, cry out for change and immediate reform. There is now a bill pending in the council co-sponsored by council member Che that would stop this. And that is a teed up for a hearing, we hope. Uh, we'd love to collaborate with Friendship Place to uh, join a coalition of now 35 plus civil rights, human rights, anti-poverty and faith-based groups that are pushing for this. Along with, interestingly enough, some in the business community, I'm, I'm really heartened to see some conversations at the Chamber of Commerce and elsewhere about this, um, uh, to stop this policy that in effect criminalizes poverty uh, here in the district. There've been some, some wins on this topic recently. Uh, I mentioned the ending of the suspensions of licenses. The council also stopped Metro fare evasion, which had similarly disparate impact and literally just a punishment for not, not paying uh, the fee and many times not having the money to pay the fee. Um, in terms of where we go from here, um, there, there's going to be a debate on this and related topics in coming months and uh, likely into 2022. And I wanna pick up something on something that came up in the chat because it's, it's a critical question. It's one that uh, I've talked about with council member Che and others, uh, and it is a legitimately difficult issue. The question is, how do we make sure that there are incentives to pay if we're gonna take away the denial of the driver's license? Uh, and what we've seen from national studies done by the Fines and Fees Justice Center that Peter mentioned and others, is that the incentives are already there. For those who can pay, the incentives exist. What are the incentives? Well, in the District of Columbia, if you don't uh, pay your fines and fees, 
you cannot get a professional license. In the District of Columbia, if you don't pay your fines and fees, you have your state tax refunds from the Office of the Chief Financial Officer taken back, deducted, offset. You can have credit issues. You can have harassment by debt collectors. Nobody wants that. And so overwhelmingly what happens is that people with uh, some or medium amount of wealth simply go online, take out their credit card and have this minor inconvenience of paying their fine. But people without who cannot suddenly it becomes very expensive for them because what would have been a 50 or $100 penalty is now $200. And if the district has to engage in debt collection, there's a 20% surcharge. So suddenly uh, a person with less money and the ability to just come up with uh, $200 immediately, uh, uh, $100 immediately is looking at $240 uh, and that much more difficulty in paying those fines. Um, so uh, uh, given the massive um, impact um, on both the wealth side and on the ability to get to jobs, to get to childcare, to get to um, healthcare appointments, to get to groceries, to get to the laundromat, as well as the criminal offense. Um, we are hopeful that Councilman, Councilman Merche and colleagues uh, will be able to push this through uh, in, in this council period, uh, we work with the mayor to get this done. Uh, I wanna pause there uh, and just say again, thank you uh, to Friendship Place um, and uh, thanks for listening. I'm gonna put in the chat two things. Number one is a report that we did that I mentioned. Number two is a recent Washington Post article getting into the, uh, some of the details of the difficulties uh, in, in DC specific data. And the Post did a great job of six months of, of combing the data, uh, working with us and other groups uh, and to invite people to take a look at that. And I'm happy to be a resource uh, and have my colleagues be a resource as well uh, in follow up and, and thank you again. All right, well, thank you so much. I mean, it's all very interesting. A lot of needy stuff here. Uh, we want to make sure we had time for Alyssa Ramsey Paul from our team, who's going to talk a bit about what she sees as someone with a long time experience here in DC, working with those who are experiencing poverty, as well as what we're doing at Friendship Place to really make a difference. So Alyssa, over to you. Thank you. Um, so, well, thank you all for being with us. I'm very excited to have been able to share this panel with uh, both Peter and Ariel. Um, Aside from my day job, which has been for the last, uh, going on 26 years, working with um, persons experiencing homelessness here in the District of Columbia, um, I also teach as an adjunct uh, faculty member at American University. And in my forensic psychology series that I teach, I use Peter's books and very much love doing that uh, because <laughs> there it is. Um, because in, in teaching, particularly in, a forensic psychology sort of intro and advanced um, program, a lot of times our students come in and these are folks who are going to be our workers of tomorrow and the people who will create and either sustain or change the systems that are in place today as, as Peter and Ariel both described that um, the injustice we see and some of the changes that we're starting to see. But as an educator, I take very seriously making sure that they are well-informed to not just look at individual what we call pathology, meaning blaming people for there being some internal reason that they end up criminal justice involved, but understanding the social injustice that occurs that also creates both uh, when, there, when there are um, internal reasons, but also the barriers to just having enough to live, to being able to have housing, to being able to um, sustain employment, to being able to live without fear of being judged by the color of your skin or other characteristics that you were born with and have no ability to change and no desire to, quite frankly. So I'm just going to cover some uh, very DC specific information and then talk quickly about the impact this has on housing and how Friendship Place works to really intervene at the systemic level um, of the injustice, but also to moderate the impact of poverty, um, well, the criminalization of poverty and the criminalization, criminalization of mental illness, quite frankly, as well. So um, we've heard a lot about you know, nationwide some of the ways that the criminal justice system really is um, a very economically driven system. One of the things that we have found is in the, dist the District of Columbia, for the most part, eliminated a cash bail system in 1992. One of the concerns in that time around that advocacy was, well, people who are in jail should be in jail, right? Like if they, we let them out, they're going to reoffend, they're going to commit crimes, our streets will be unsafe. Here's the reality. Less than 2% of people are rearrested for violent crimes 
um, when we went to the system of mostly releasing folks pending, pending trial for misdemeanors. Um, so that's something that I think is important to keep in context because all of us were raised in a certain, um, with a certain understanding of the role of the criminal justice system. And I think we're doing a good job of starting to really examine those assumptions, but it becomes important to understand why do we believe that? And is that reality? And in that case, it, it's not reality that in getting away from cash bail, we make the streets unsafe. Um, the reality is that we lose some money in the city, but there are certainly other ways to make money, I would think. Um, according to the ABLE Foundation, 57% um, of pe people experiencing homelessness in this country report having been incarcerated. In the District of Columbia, the last count around 2018, approximately 30% of folks experiencing homelessness attribute their homelessness direct, as a direct cause of uh, being incarceration. That's alarming. That's, you know, you think about the volumes of people that experience homelessness on a yearly basis in DC, that's thousands of people that would have never experienced the trauma of losing their home, possibly their family, employment, other supports, and had an increase in stress-related illness, in psychiatric conditions, maybe even in substance use, because of the impact that becoming homeless has had. Um, and that's just based on everything that Peter and Ariel have spoken about with the criminalization of things that are minor compared to what we would expect a criminal justice system that is focused on public safety to be involving itself with. In addition, this is a little bit of a staggering statistic, but fairly recently, within the last couple of years, the United States has surpassed both El Salvador and Turkey, which previously held the world record of having the uh, largest volume of um, people incarcerated per capita. The U.S. now is the front runner at 639 um, people per 100,000 uh, residents. The District of Columbia is at 1,153 um, incarcerated persons per 100,000. So that makes us not just the highest in the country, but because of the U.S.'s um, making the unfortunate record of being the highest in the world, D.C. is now the highest has the highest record in the world for incarceration per capita. With that, adding to the, uh, uh, the statistics that Ariel and Peter put in, it, it makes perfect sense. We know that we are not charging um, persons of color, uh, minorities, the same with the same level of crime as other persons. And so we are seeing trends where people both with a lower socioeconomic status and largely um, Black, Latino, and other uh, minority um, residents are being charged with more serious crimes for the same offenses. This increases the numbers of people that are incarcerated and also decreases opportunities as they leave incarceration. So to give you an idea, um, the Bureau of Prisons run many, many of the facilities, um, both federal, but also several local jails. Nearly 95% of their returning uh, citizens um, in the last couple of years were um, Black Americans. 96% of that number were male. And so when you look at it that way, that's just a glaringly alarming statistic of where our criminal justice system focuses its attention and tar honestly targets um, the black male community in particular, but minority communities far more than others. And we need to really look at um, not just the impact on those systems, but as well, what does that mean when people come out? And so that's where we come in a friendship place. So. Coming out, we know that people with um, a criminal record of any kind, um, I've actually, as a social worker, many years, I've seen this happen, whether people are coming out with um, a history of violent crimes or a history of misdemeanors or um, what we call nuisance offenses, which happens in the homeless population a lot. Um, someone's uh, urinating in public because we have no public restrooms in DC and they get um, charged with public indecency. I've even seen clients put on the registry for things like that if they were too close to a school or a church and then they can't get off again. And so now if somebody looks at your record, it looks a lot worse than it actually is, but this also creates barriers to qualifying for certain types of housing, many types of housing, quite honestly. Um, being able to get employed. And even if you are able to be fortunate enough to get housed, the sex offender registry is public. And so we have had folks who have been targeted and victimized by neighbors being able to ascertain what has, you know, what has brought them 
uh, to this place. Um, but I am happy to say that here at Friendship Place, we work very hard on getting people into housing, getting them into permanent housing quickly and with the supportive services that they need in order to work past the point where they pay their debt to society, they're here. Our goal is to help people achieve not just housing stability, but moving towards whatever their, their next best life is. And what I mean by that is across health outcomes, public health outcomes, behavioral health outcomes, employment, income, all the things that are the same goals that all of us around this call have for ourselves and for our families and for our loved ones. Every one of us, you know, no one, no one asks to be born, but we all come here and need to take up space. We deserve somewhere to live, somewhere to be safe, um, somewhere to take care of our kids. And Friendship Place serves both uh, individuals and families. Um, we serve youth as young as 17. We serve, we, there's no end point on the adults or permanent supportive housing. We mean permanent. If you're in our housing, we will, we will help you for the rest of your life um, and are happy to do so. Um, to give you a little bit of an idea, the way we do that is that our approach is a little different and we're very, very committed to it. So some of you may have heard some of these terms before. I'm going to just quickly tell you what they mean here. We use a trauma-informed care approach. We understand that when people have been through this sort of mass incarceration and living with the impact of institutionalized racism and classism, it's created an unjust society that's set many people up to fail. And even if they make attempts to climb out of that, having more and more barriers piled on top of them sometimes can be crushing, quite honestly. Um, so using a trauma-informed care approach, we are allowing people to be where they are and giving them the best locus of control that they have. We are offering services. We are not mandating them. We are not making people qualified to receive our services. We approach each relationship with compassion and understanding and knowledge. Um, we make sure that we're knowledgeable about both what's happening at the city level, but also at the national level. And when there are gaps in services or when we have the ability to help inform um, better solutions, we do that. Um, we are happy to be celebrating 30 years of um, intervening um, at both the systemic level and on the individual level to moderate the impact of the criminalization of poverty um, and mental illness. Um, to give you an idea, we started in 1991 with our adult street uh, outreach program and we served 75 people that first year. Today, we have 11 divisions that serve approximately 3,500 people um, on an annual basis. We are busy, but what we're busy doing is trying to not just end the problems that create the need for us to have all of those divisions and all of those services, but also on an individual level to give people the reins to their life back and to break down the barriers to housing, to break down the barriers to healthcare and to break down the, to break through a lot of these pipelines back to prison, whether it's um, school to prison, whether it's recidivism, whether it's um, the unjust way some laws are written. Um, I believe Lynn Amano, who is our advocacy specialist is on this call as well and has done heroic work um, to partner with our city partners and others in order to get us where we need to go. Um, I'll leave you with one thought, which is something that was taught to me very early on in, the, in my career, and I make sure that I tell my students every single semester. We're talking about systems which can seem very, very big. Um, they seem to take on a life of their own and exist whether we show up for them or not. But here's something to consider. Systems are made up of individual people who make individual decisions every single day. All of you on the call seem like you are intelligent folk and you're here to challenge what your thoughts are and to gain more information so that you can decide whether or not you need to continue with the decisions you're making for your part of it, or if there's more decisions you can be making. And my hope is you'll take away what you've learned from all of us today and help influence those around you. We don't change systems by attacking them or deciding, you know, it's, it's the system, we can't do that. We change them by changing what we do every day and by influencing others around us. And I hope you all will take up that charge with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. And I, lo I love that point about it. it. It really is individual decisions and individual actions. And so why don't we pivot on that question? Um, folks have put questions in the chat here. Let's start with this one. What is the number one thing we can do as individuals to 
I'll say stop all this to 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 put an end. So Peter, Lissa, Ariel, whoever wants to take that question. Uh, I think the basic thing uh, is uh, everything that we do to help individual people. When you add them up, um, that's a lot, a lot of people. So that's uh, very, very fundamental. Uh, but then uh, in the community uh, or national, and of course in, in uh, DC, we've got national all over the place, uh, to find uh, organizations uh, who are, uh, if they're a lawyer, it's, it's uh, easy to, to find, uh, to, to, to work on things, including things that happen in the city council or, or in Congress. Uh, but uh, the, my basic answer is to, to find an organization on a particular issue, I mean, ACLU, for example, uh, to, to support that. Uh, and, and of course, <laughs> your organization, I uh, go first there. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, pe people need to find a place where they can be part of it. Uh, it that's how to do it. Thank you. Um there was another question in the chat that I think was very interesting. And Peter, you're probably best suited to answer this one. How, how do these punitive fines and, and, and ways that we are just inflicting cruelty on those who experience poverty using the law, how are these not facing constitutional challenges or, or are they? Well, some of them are. Uh, it, it's, uh, there are uh, Supreme Court cases, not to get into the, the details of it, but uh, if somebody essentially uh, is, is uh, put in, into a jail or a prison beyond uh, what, the, what the court said, uh, then uh, it, it's unconstitutional. And there's a lot of that for the things that I told you about holding on to people and uh, with money that they have. Um, the, uh, of, of course, beyond that, the Supreme Court's not our friend uh, these days. Uh, and and uh, in any case, uh, these, the kinds of things that we talked about here, uh, including the short list that, that, that I did, uh, is at the state level. Uh, there are cases uh, that have, have gone uh, through the, the federal system uh, and held that didn't go to the Supreme Court. But uh, for example, um, uh, and, and a lot of it is, is going to the legislature. Uh, so I, I told you that, that there were 22 states that, that changed uh, on, on what's happening with legislation, with, with people being, uh, taking their, their license. Uh, uh, that's, uh, there's, there's some uh, going to court, but it's largely going to the legislature. Uh, and that's organized now, going back to the earlier question, uh, when I talked to, uh, to Fines and Fees Justice Center, uh, looking for something to connect, write that down, uh, get in uh, with, with, with uh, them. Um, and so, so there have been some terrific litigation. There's an organization that I mentioned called Civil Rights Corps. You can certainly support it. Uh, uh, and, and so uh, it, it varies for, uh, when you're talking about fines and fees uh, and, and about bail, uh, you're talking both legislation uh, and, and uh, uh, making a uh, going to court. Uh, there's a long standing, for example, a huge fight in, in California uh, that the, uh, uh, the system that they have on uh, my, my bail uh, is unconstitutional uh, under state law. Uh, so then uh, I won't, we could go <laughs> close up here just on this and keep for another hour, but it's still going on in the legislature. So that's an example. There's a great story in, in Houston, Texas, uh, which is about the, the system uh, in in that county, uh, and it did actually go to federal federal court. Uh, so you have examples uh, of that, um, and of course, when you're talking about homeless, we have some cases in the Ninth Circuit, uh, and we'd love to get those around other parts of the country. There's a great story in my book about Texas. Uh, you know, we thought who knew Texas, but uh, 
the, the, the state Supreme Court uh, man, who's probably a Republican, is he just thinks it's terrible so many kids get sent to um, to court instead of to the to the public to the principal. Uh, well, that that's done uh, actually uh, a combination of largely uh, it's going to the legislature. I could keep you going uh, all over uh, because everything there's a lot of action. And especially uh, over the last uh, seven years since Ferguson, but maybe that gives you some examinations. One sort of follow-up question that was in the chat: How is this cost-effective for loca localities to contract out with private prisons or just to imprison so many people? It would seem that this is something that would be incredibly costly, even if you are charging. Uh, well, some of it's stupid and they're just so nasty that, that they do it and they actually think they're, they're getting money and they don't. Um, so it's a little bit hard to understand. But if you're talking about, let's say, a prison uh, and you say, well, I can run this better uh, and do it for profit uh, instead of it being on you know, a, a public uh, uh, we're in a prison. Uh, what they do is it's terrible, uh, and the money, uh, the 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 food is awful. Everything about it is just horrible. That's the short answer. I also think it. You know, the thing that to remember too is once we go to for profit, we've now, you know, we and I and I think we send mixed messages um, here in the U.S. about what the purpose of incarceration is and the purpose of our criminal justice system. We still talk about rehabilitation, but we set it up as a punitive system where it doesn't stop being punitive after a sentence is completed. When we go to for-profit prisons, and I had some things there and I didn't touch on it because that's a whole other conversation, we, we now disincentivize any um, rehabilitative services. And so what this looks like in a lot of places is inpatient or sorry inpatient um, behavioral health services for inmates is cut access to psychiatric care is cut access to even medication management for folks going in with a severe mental illness who we knew going in they had it they can't even get the medication that will uh, get them stable and keep them stable in a time of high stress there people are more likely to have incidents in prison if they're not psychiatrically stable or there's other things going on and rather than making creating the best possible solutions for them to get out and get their life back on track or like in some other countries where there are open prisons where you might have gotten sent to prison but what does that have to do with paying your bills and taking care of your family you still have to work and pay bills and take care of things and they don't have higher rates of um, violent crimes than we do quite the opposite they have the opposite and so it begs a larger question of what is our purpose of our criminal justice system and where and how do we change that focus to something that creates and sustains a just society? And in the end, I, I, so seem, it seems in the end, when you do that measurement of what the costs are versus what the outcomes, it almost does seem like the cruelty is the point. It's, you're not there to help people. You're not there to rehabilitate, rehabilitate people. You're not there for cost effectiveness. It's simply there to to inflict cruelty, I don't know. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. I, I, I really do think it has been wonderful. Um, we are up against one o'clock, um, but we probably could take one or two more minutes if anyone wants to offer one closing comment or thought, uh, Lissa, Peter, Ariel. I think everybody was, tr thank you very much, thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> and Lissa, looks like we lost your camera there. So All with right. that, I have, I have one uh, closing comment. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Edelman is the same today as he was some 53 years ago <laughs> when he gave this young black man oh. an opportunity to work with Senator Kennedy's speechwriters. We were at 20, uh, 2000 L Street at the time. And I just want to say I have been forever grateful to him for that opportunity. And he hasn't changed. He's still fighting for the same things. Oh, what wonderful, wonderful closing testimonial. Oh, um, thank you. That makes my, <laughs> thanks my day, my week. <laughs> thank um, you. Uh, before I throw to Jean-Michel to wrap us up here, I do want to hold up copies of 
two of Peter's recent books here. I'll have to do it like this and block myself out. Uh, Not a Crime to Be Poor and So Rich, So Poor. Uh, so poor. Both are fascinating readings. I can think of no higher compliment than to say what I said to Peter when we came together. Um, as I read it, I wanted to throw it across the room. It made me so angry. But at the same time, you offer a lot of hope and solutions so that perhaps there is a way out of this morass. Um, but so thank you. Thank you for being part of this. Lissa, Ariel, thank you as well. Jean Michel, would you like to uh, close this up or are you going to talk about the virtual breakfast and everything first? <laughs> I'll, oh, you're on mute. So while you're on mute, I will say we are doing our friends and neighbors breakfast live on October 7th. And then we're doing a virtual celebration the evening of October 10th. Uh, so email me if you're interested. Now I'll throw it to Jean-Michel. Yes, thank you, Chris. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Wes, for sharing. Uh, Peter, Ariel, Lisa, thank you so much for taking the time to prepare for this and be with us today. I think we all learned a lot. Uh, and uh, Peter and Ariel, we would love to work with you more on this. Uh, we have a, a community organizer now on the staff, Lynn Amano, and we're looking at new possibilities to advocate both at the local and federal level. So more to come on this and uh, we will be in touch. We hope to see you both soon for another presentation, of course, and to all, the, all of you on the call. Thank you for taking the time to be with us, of course. Thank you for your support. And Mary, it's always great to see you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Well, everyone have a great rest of your afternoon. And again, if you want to attend any of these events coming up, uh, send me an email and we'll make sure we get you invited. So <laughs> have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>